Hello, Barry William Magliditti, your host of the Comeback Game podcast, CEO and founder of the Game Changers, and welcome to this episode of the Comeback Game podcast, where we speak to Philip Gibbs, who's a world-renowned business strategist who's mastered the art of referral partnerships and collaborative marketing strategies. Uh, during this interview, Philip talks about how his exit from corporate world into becoming an entrepreneur and pursuing a hobby-based business was the biggest mistake of his life 16 years ago, but also one that's providing with the steps, the strategies, and the tools to grow the phenomenal business that he has to date. He also shares with us what his top three tips are of the last 16 years of being an entrepreneur. And they're certainly not something that I, that I thought of or that's been mentioned on the show before, but something that rang very, very true to my heart. We dive deep and speak more around how many entrepreneurs often focus on things uh, that cost them a lot of money and a lot of time in the beginning and how this is absolutely the wrong way of doing things and how picking the low hanging fruit, noticing what's right in front of you can help your business grow faster, more profitably and later have more fulfillment than ever before. We also speak around the myth and the fact that your business will once or eventually become perfect, realizing that your business is always broken and it's always going to be, but how to get over yourself, overcome that and grow something that provides you and your family with the finances, with the freedom and with the fulfillment that you truly desire. Let's head over there and start this conversation with Philip now. Uh, hey Tribe, here with Philip Gibbs uh, from the UK, mate. How are you doing today? Yeah, I'm really good, thanks Barry. Delighted to, uh, to be on this podcast with you. Yeah, excited for it. Yeah, it's been a journey getting here, mate. And uh, for the people out there watching or listening, where are you calling in from today? So I'm, uh, I'm in the UK, uh, Oxford, um, the university town of Oxford. So uh, yeah, right in the middle of the UK. Fantastic. And I'm, uh, I'm actually calling in from Chenggu, uh, Bali, Indonesia, from my, uh, my place here as well. So Wi-Fi is good. Uh, we're off to a great start, mate. For those that are watching this today or listening, uh, let's just give a bit of a brief background about, uh, about you. Like what, is, what is it that you do currently? So, uh, so currently I, uh, I help businesses scale through referral partnerships. Um, so it touches in the world of like affiliate marketing, affiliate partnerships, stroke referral partnerships. I'm just really super passionate about helping business owners um, scale and use performance-based marketing to scale yeah. rather than gambling money up front on ads hoping that uh, you know sales funnels convert at, at some point in time later down the line yeah. i'm as we'll no doubt touch on later on i just uh, i just learned from experience that if there's a way that you can link your marketing spend to the return that you're getting um then it allows you to scale much faster yeah and i guess there's a place for both depending on where you're at with your journey. And we certainly meet a lot of clients that come through our programs, uh, clients that are very early on in their business, they're maybe doing a few hundred thousand dollars a year, maybe even half or three quarters million a year, uh, don't necessarily have a lot of money to spend on marketing and haven't really capitalized on things like referral marketing and joint ventures. But then likewise, we also meet a lot of um, companies who have got money to spend a bit more advanced and paid strategies can work very, very well for them. But I very much believe as well that anything related to marketing, there should be a clear and tangible ROI. And, you know, why not pluck the low hanging fruit? And in many cases, that is referral based marketing and partnerships and JVs and so forth as well. Yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. I mean, I, I, yeah, I agree with what you said. It's businesses miss the, they miss the obvious opportunity that's in front of them or, or there tends to be a, to, to look for feeling that they need to constantly be looking for, for new leads outside of their network. And there's value in that, but equally um, there's often um, many people that you've worked with already that would happily refer you. You just need to remind them that they, they could do it. Yeah. I think for me, the, 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 more, the more that I go through business, like I worked out um, recently that I've been in business half my life. I'm 34 years old. I've been in my own business since I was 17 years old. And the more and more I go down this journey, the more successful uh, my companies become and the more failures that I make, the more lessons that I learn. I realize that quite often business owners are attracted to the most difficult thing, uh, you know, or, or often, you know, the, the thing that consumes the most amount of time or money with less return. I don't know what it is, but I see I, uh, business seems to become simpler the more that you're in it. And I think part of that is the attitude, but I want to dive into a minute what is referral based marketing specifically what you do before we do that though mate how long how long ago did you get into business like where did this all start for you 
Yeah, so um, so I got into my own business in 2004 um, yeah. after being in the corporate world for 13 odd years yeah. um, and then just deciding that um, that I didn't I didn't want my boss my boss's job or my boss's boss's job and therefore really what I what was I doing there so um, uh, so I left the corporate world and then started on my own journey with a very traditional bricks and mortar business to start with um, and then uh, we built that uh, and sold it um, and then it's in 2008 that I got into the the digital world so been in the space for a while now I like to say you know that the internet wasn't black and white when I started but it was definitely blue and gray you know yeah. I mean I, I used to work on those blue and gray screens it wasn't green and black you know like yeah. the early Amstrad days <laughs> yeah. but the uh, you know when I started like Windows was blue and gray that's that's the way the internet was right so it's, <laughs> it's amazing I, how I still remember dial-up I'm, I'm young enough or old enough to still remember dial-up and uh, oh. MSN Messenger, you could connect with people uh, all over the world. For me, back then, it was uh, very much my teenage years. It was a lot of girls from other parts yeah. of the world. Um, but either still. So, so when you started your own business, what did you what did you venture into? Like, what was the first kind of venture for you? Uh, so this actually, so I played golf since I was like eight years old, and I got an opportunity via some contacts um, of mine to. Uh, to take the business knowledge I've got from the corporate world and, uh, and move it into running a golf and country club. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, at the start, it was I was like super excited about it because it was like, well, I love playing. Uh, I love playing golf. I've played golf at quite a reasonable level since I was a kid. Um, what a wicked idea to go and run, manage your own golf and country club. And then rapidly within like 18 months realized that it's probably the single biggest mistake that I've ever, that I'd ever made up until that point in my life, right? Turning a hobby into a career was not necessarily the smartest move. And, um, and hence what we shared at the start of this call around business owners picking the most difficult thing. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly, exactly. I just like I was like rubbing my hands together, thinking, "Wow, I'm going to start, you know, build a career in the in a game that I love," and yeah. um, and then rapidly realised that, that that it meant that I'd got no hobby because yeah. now my, you know, I'd got no hobby, no switch off time at all. Um, so the Golf Country Club was. I, think it's, I was going to say, I think that's where it starts for a lot of entrepreneurs, though. Like many entrepreneurs, starts with something they're really interested in a hobby a, a talent or something and then they have no idea about business and and that lack of business knowledge and the stress and struggle of starting your own venture often uh diminishes the enjoyment of that that said hobby it certainly was the case for me yeah yeah I, well i think there's a difference between uh between what you're passionate about and the results that you're passionate in creating this is what i've learned you know the results that you're passionate about creating and then what you do as a hobby to relax and switch off. Mm. Now, I think you a hundred percent, you should build businesses around what you're passionate about and the transformation you're, you're passionate about creating for people. I think that is, that's a really solid direction mm. to go in. Not necessarily. My mistake was I went down my hobby route um, and whilst I love the game of golf and what have you, and, and I love the idea of running a golf country club, it meant that it just consumed every part of me. Yeah. Um, and there was no, uh, there was no room space to escape and, and think about a bigger picture. And pro probably learnt some pretty hard lessons I could imagine too, you know, like oh, man. Green, green out of the corporate world, deciding to take over the world one country club at a time. Yeah. Uh, what what were some of the oh. what were some of the challenges you faced or created, let's say, when you chose that decision? Well, I think the single biggest one. I mean, they they. Um, my dad actually said this to me when he's been a great mentor of mine. And and when I was leaving the corporate role, um, I mean, like you know, like any job, you know, you stick the hours in because you want to you want to succeed. You want to be good at what you do. You want to you want to escalate up the ladder. Um, but I remember my dad saying to, you know, he said, well, now you've now you've just swapped your job for another job um, and you're really just going to decide how many, you know, what hours you work each day rather than how many hours you work each day. And I thought, well, yeah, you know, it's really the same thing. And 
that was the biggest thing is that golf and country clubs like it is open every day of the year well 364 days of the year 16 hours a day and i had i, I was super green around the ears when i when i went into that because i thought well I, I know the business but i was like oh holy shit this is a monster that you yeah. and then of course there's not they're quite diverse businesses and and most businesses are you know there's not one single part to it we've got we've got membership uh we you know we've got two retail stores we've got a conferencing side we've got a hotel side we've got a food and beverage side well ultimately they're all really individual businesses um and there was a team in place to run it but it was like whoa it's I mean, I look back on it now with actually very fond memories because it was four and a half years where I really learned everything that I fall back on now. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, I made some monumental, I won't swear, but I mean, I, we had some moments during that where, <laughs> where I was on a rapid learning curve. <laughs> I, like, I like what you share there because it really encapsulate, encapsulates for me like what the comeback game podcast is about. It's like, you look back, like on one hand, most challenging four and a half years of your life, wouldn't go and do it again, made a lot of mistakes, was on a very rapid learning curve. Yet on the other hand, you look back upon that experience very, very fondly because it actually taught you everything you fall back on today. And this is what I honestly see is uh, the opportunity that we have through challenges. You know, like I've been in business, as I said, for 17 years, challenges don't stop. Uh, what happens is we learn to deal with them better. You know, things come up for me now, occasionally, very occasionally might trigger me, but most often it's a smile going, cool, how can we fix this? Because when a challenge or a problem comes up, it's an opportunity to fix a hole or mend a gap in your current process, in your current business model. Yet in the beginning, it's like, God, will these challenges just go away already? Yet, you know, it really is such a beautiful learning curve. Can you, you know, if and can you choose to see it that way? You know, otherwise yeah. it can be one, one a hell of a, a hell of a shitstorm. Let's just say I'm going to swear that uh, you know often taints us from ever wanting to go in business again. Yeah, well, I think um, I was talking to a really good friend of mine the other day actually, and we were talking about how how your levels of emotional intelligence link back to your experience stroke success as an entrepreneur because i think you know i think successful entrepreneurs are some of the most emotionally intelligent people i know because you kind of have to be absolutely otherwise you just get ripped apart yeah. you know you, you've got a the level of self-awareness that you just gain through experience and know that you know certain things get you back up in the early days where you just learn to dismiss them or treat them differently or even navigate your way around this whole situation differently with a with a bit of experience later down the line but yeah. um yeah i think i think successful entrepreneurs and their level of emotional intelligence there's one thing you could work on and and you know in the personal development area yeah, is, is emotional intelligence and just being aware of why you do the things you do why you act the way you do why you surround yourself with the people you do what you're yeah. really looking for it is it supporting you all that kind of stuff i think as soon as i got a network that was um i'm not going to say i had a network that was unsupportive but when i had a network around me that understood what i was trying to achieve and the obstacles and challenges that come way, come your way um, and can actually contribute positively to helping you succeed, um, then that was a big, big boost. So I think a top tip for anybody listening is despite any friendship and network you might have around you when you're starting out in business or, or even or if you're- family influences. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but the- but get get the get people that are a little bit ahead of you or just a bit further ahead of you around that experience that understand what you're going through and can genuinely guide you and give you advice in the right direction because yeah. as soon as i did that um things got a lot easier a lot faster yeah in many ways too i, I never shared this before but just reflecting on what you just shared then uh, phil is you know if you're in early stage businesses like find a room where you can be the dumbest person in the room but if you're more experienced in business you, you know, you've been around for a long time you've achieved some success find a room where you're one of the smarter ones and the reason that i say that 
is because that gives you the opportunity to practice your leadership skills, which is this emotional yeah. intelligence we spoke about. Like you get to a point in business where business is kind of business. It's like you generate leads, you make sales, you fulfill orders, you hire the right people, you implement the right strategies. You know, like, like it's, it's, it's kind of basic-ish. Now, I'm not, not trying to undermine like the challenge of business, but, but there's some key steps to running a profitable business and running yeah. a profitable business works without you. Once you get there, like the thinking is very different around strategic competitive advantage and things like that. But to be a smarter person in a room where you can actually practice your leadership ability and practice, you know, teaching and training people really, I think helps to accelerate that, that um, emotional intelligence, you know, the EQ and that, that we're speaking about here. And let me just kind of, I guess, uh, pop a few bubbles right now for the viewers and listeners that yeah. are watching this. And that is that your business is always going to be broken right? Your business is always going to be broken. Like you're never going to get to a stage where your business is like, yep, you know what? My business is perfect. I can just step back and the thing's just going to run like clockwork forever. No, it's not going to happen. Yeah. So true. So true. Yeah. So how, how did you, how did you transition from uh, your steep learning curve in the country club? Uh, and do you play golf before I ask this next question? Do you still play golf? Yeah, no, I do. Yeah, yeah. I actually, <laughs> it's, I'm back to enjoying it now. Yeah. <laughs> excellent, excellent, excellent. So, mate, how did you transition from country club into affiliate marketing or referral marketing? So we were, um, uh, we wanted to, we wanted to grow and sell the, the, the golf and country club. So we, um, we were on a four year, three and a bit, four year plan. And uh, obviously the key driver behind that is to boost the profitability of every department, every factor that we had, and ultimately the bottom line to the highest level we could. So we got the best return. Um, and we had two retail stores on site. One did like home wares and all the rest of it. And, uh, and the other one obviously did golf equipment. And, you know, we'd got this 150 odd grams worth of stock that sort of stat, sat there and we turned it over, you know, once a quarter or, you know, every every 16 weeks, something like that. And um, and I was like, well, this is OK, but but like, bloody hell, you know, we're only able to sell to people that come down the drive. Um, so I looked at like taking it online and, and you know, this is 2000 and five, six. So blue and gray days. Near as easy as it is now, right? You know, it's just like we That's spent funny. we spent twelve grand on our first website, right, to sell like literally a handful of products online. You know, it was just it was ridiculous when you look yeah. back on it now. Um but uh, so we started moving things online and that gave us a boost which was nice because we were reaching more people. But then I went to a seminar in, in, um, in London, in the British Library in London. And um, it was by a guy who, I don't know, if, um, we run a program over here called Dragon's Den, Shark Tank, it's called yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, and whatever it might be. Called. Yeah, yeah, but around the world, it's called different things, but basically that kind of thing. And it was run by one of those guys. And he was talking about affiliate marketing and basically how you can... Um, build this sales for army of people that are going to go out there and promote your product and service for you. And I thought, well, that's cool. But I've got all these accounts with people that you, you can't necessarily get product from, you know, we, 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 <laughs> we'd worked hard to open some of the accounts that we had. And, um, and I was like, well, why don't I just say, well, why can't I just, why can't I sell your stuff without having to buy it in? Uh, you know, and, uh, you know, why can't I just access your entire library of stock and you ship it for me and and I'll so I basically took the affiliate model and stroke drop shipping type model and uh, and just cut that in and started. And the result was that we were stocking a lot less um, in, in, you know, we reduced our stock by about half. So that freed up a shitload of cash that we got tied up in yeah. in in uh, in stock and uh, we started turning over considerably more because we you know we were able to service products and, and what have you outside and grow our audience and be known for more than just golf equipment or like homewares um and that really started to grow the business and as as that scaled it became a significant contributor to the bottom line because of course it was all cash in 
It mm. might have only been 20, 30, 40% um, of the sale price, but it was ultimately, it was, it was all cash into the bottom line straight away with, with very zero, very little risk from us. We didn't have to deal with returns, lost in post, all the other shit that goes on with the e-commerce stuff. Um, so as we came and exited from that, I was I actually went for a beer with my dad down the pub and he said, because I genuinely did not know what I was going to do next when we were exiting. I'd, I'd thrown myself at building the business to a point where we'd got a deal and we, we did built it for somebody to buy it. And, um, and it was like, well, shit, if this deal actually goes through, what am I going to do next? Because I'd had zero time to think about that. And Dad just said, well, why don't you write a list of all the things that you love and perhaps more importantly, write a list of all the things that you hate. Um, and on the love side was the, you know, commission only performance based marketing, affiliate marketing side. And uh, on the hate side was, you know, uh, uh, premises, overheads, staff. <laughs> you know, it's like oh man i'll never build i'll never build another business with we had 28 team members and for me that was like 27 too many most of the time um you know it's just like i i love working with people but man you know sometimes you know with that you've always got like one one and a half employees that that aren't doing what you want to do or are playing you up and it's just a constant people management game and that's not necessarily where my skills are at. So I got somebody in to help me with that <laughs> and take over. But yeah. I, mean, I realized it was a weakness. But yeah. Um, yeah. Which it is for most, most visionaries, the weakness is managing team effectively. Um, they can lead, but leading is not managing. There's a distinct difference between managing yeah. staff and leading staff. And um, it's certainly the journey that I've been through with my business and, and exiting operationally. And equally, too, is something we've helped you know, so many of our clients go through as well. Uh, you look at all the great combinations, you look at uh, McDonald's, you look at Apple, you look at all these combinations, there's always that visionary and integrator role, someone who's good at leading and someone who's good at managing. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, yeah, that's a great tip for anybody listening is that don't feel that just because you just because you might want to be in charge, don't feel that that in charge element means that you have to take all those roles underneath it on. Because you absolutely don't. And the minute I got, um, his name was Phil as well, but the minute I got Phil in to like manage operationally the team, um, the business took a whole different shape. Because yeah. I, I, felt, I felt relieved because I could go off and do the bits that I loved, created opportunities, sales, relationships, all that kind of stuff. And he dealt with all the bits that I hated of, of so-and-so's off sick and how we're going to cover that this yeah. weekend and blah, blah, blah. Um, but yeah, I think that's a really top tip because I think people hold on to certain roles because they believe they need to do it as the business owner, whereas yeah. actually they're much better off bringing a supporting staff in somebody that enjoys that role much better than you do. Well, let, let's be honest. Most entrepreneurs or business owners are control freaks and you know, that control freakism is what kills growth because we want to be the one that does everything or even if we say we don't want to we still walk around with a belief that no one can do it better than i can and yeah. that belief you know and and that mentality that kills growth and that the more like i look now at some of the stuff that happens in my business i thought you know holy hell that that i wouldn't have allowed that to happen or i wouldn't have been okay with that 10 years ago but equally too there's no there's no issue with what's going on it was just how tightly tightly wound and how high strung i was 10 years ago and this is why you know, prior companies, I, you know, either hit stagnation or grew them way too fast in such a way that I lost complete control because, you know, I was the one trying to do everything and I wasn't building my teams out or my systems and processes out like I, like I, I do now. Yeah. 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 They just a hundred percent really support you in that. I think it's a, it can be a really tough realization, but I think it's the one for me that released the most growth. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, so what is it like? We've got, we've got a, a, a few minutes left here and I'd love, like, what is affiliate marketing and how can someone who's watching or listening to this today look to start to implement? I know that you're going to share a link to a free training, which is awesome. But, you know, for people that are, that are on, the, on the call now, listening, watching this somewhere in the world, 
uh, what is affiliate marketing per se and how can they look to start to implement it in their business regardless of what business they're in? Yeah, sure. So, um, so I look at it from the business owner's point of view and, and really it's about building up a, a sales force, an army of salespeople that are out there actively promoting your product and services to their communities. And I think sometimes it's better to give like examples of, of really so that businesses can like relate to it. So, you know, Amazon was one of the first to get into the, uh, the affiliate game. Uh, and basically, um, uh, Amazon, you can pretty much sell any product on Amazon or Amazon have this Amazon associates program where you can sign up and you can sell pretty much any product or service from Amazon. Um, but then lots of businesses have then taken that model and said, okay, well, well, I don't necessarily want to sell on Amazon, but I want to build my own team of salespeople that are out there promoting my stuff. And it's now just scaling with, with social media going in the direction it is. You know, it's never been easier to share and recommend great products and services with either just your friends or your community that you may have built up um, it's never been easier to share those links now than it is today uh, so the the growth in this type of marketing is really being fueled by the ease of the third party the affiliates themselves to go out there and share useful cool tools products services whatever it is that they find helpful that have helped them overcome a challenge um, with their own community and friends and for me it's just because it's performance based because it means that you're, you're as the business owner you are making the sale first before you are needing to pay out any money for that lead coming into your business so it does two things it means that it releases a lot of positive cash flow into your business uh, because we're not speculating money up front in the hope that a sales process will convert that profitably over a period of time. We're going very much in, and, and letting others, if you like, take any risk element of that speculative part of marketing. Mm -hmm. And we're just really fueling the results. And we may well handsomely reward those results uh, by way of commission to the to the affiliate to the referral partner um, but ultimately when you when you think about what it really costs you to acquire a customer in your business um, then then what we're what we're doing is accelerating our way to acquiring that customer with yeah. that first sale uh, and doing so with zero risk up front because we're not we're not needing to gamble any cash um, so yeah, I really, I just love it. I think it's a very, it's a very like sort of authentic way of running a business. Authenticity is used a lot at the minute, isn't it? But I think if you really succeed on how good you are, mm. um, with, with performance based marketing, because if your marketing converts and you deliver a really good product or service, then uh, then performance-based marketing, referral, affiliate marketing can work for you and can work incredibly well. Does it work, if, does it work for any industry, any business, any industry? Yeah, pr pretty much. I normally say, so across any business, any industry, yes. Obviously, <coughs> it, it is linked to paying a commission on the product. So what I typically find is that lower margin products are more difficult to make work. Um, as soon as you've got higher margin products in there um, with higher reasonable price tags linked to them, then you've got a healthier margin to be able to share with that referral affiliate partner to be able to motivate them to share it with their community and their friends. Yeah. Um, so, so some high consumable businesses with lower margin, it's not such a great fit. Um, but the, the, as soon as we grow price or margin, it's a, it's a really a no brainer. Yeah. Yeah. Let's be honest. People trust people. And so 
you know, what I'm hearing you say is one of the easiest ways to grow your business profitably without spending money on marketing is to incentivize existing customers or existing people that have, that have dealt with you to sell your product or service on your behalf, offering them some sort of a fee, a kickback, a commission for doing so. And I guess it's, yeah. it, in simple terms, it's very similar to hiring a commission-based sales team, yet with a commission-based sales team, most often you still have to provide them with leads and numbers to call. Whereas this is providing commission-based sales opportunities for people who, who can spread the word to their local networks or their local industries. Yeah, and there's, and there's companies that have, 100%, there's companies that have just grown from this. If we look at uh, Gymshark, I don't know whether you've heard of Gymshark, but one of the fastest growing uh, gym clothing brands in the world right now. And uh, started by a lad called Ben from his university uh, bedroom. Um, and just purely on the back of, you know, um, Instagram, fitness models and personal trainers um, yeah. sharing themselves, wearing the Gymshark gear, uh, having them as ambassadors, he calls them. But ultimately, it's a performance based model. Uh, you can give it any label you want, but ultimately he gets fitness models, PTs wearing his stuff. They snap it. They story themselves. They do whatever. They promote it based on the fact that it's the clothing that they wear. And of course, their followers and their community then go through and, and, and consume and buy the product themselves. Yeah. It's just, a, I think it's just a really great way of empowering people to monetize their audience with your product. Yeah. And, you know, you, you speak to people who have already had an experience of you, you know, provided that experience is, is a good one. It's far easy to push to sell, to offer, to invite people to try your product or service as opposed to, you know, spending money on cold traffic, trying to get people through that way, which is still a very effective platform, um, but mixed with a strategy like what you've shared allows you to kind of really harbor that low hanging fruit as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's like, like anything in business, is, there's no right and wrong. Um, you know, it, it's, it's about having multiple pillars of marketing. And, and I find that, that, you know, lots of people, Facebook has, done, Facebook has done an incredible job of like, you know, saturating the marketplace with Facebook is the place to go and get your leads. Uh, you know, it's, it's done an incredible job over the last sort of like sort of, you know, seven, eight, 10 years of doing that. Um, but ultimately, when you look at the number of channels that you've got that you can market a business by, you know, paid traffic should be one, but equally referral traffic should be another as well. Yeah, absolutely. Diversification yeah. is the key. Yeah. All right. So Philip, before we wrap up, what I'd love to know is what's the three best bits of advice that you've received, been given, uh, that you've realized through being in business for the last 16 or 17 years? Um, cool. Okay. Well, first one is definitely uh, pay great brains for great advice. Um, don't do not stint. You know, if you need something fixing, don't don't try and do it yourself. Um, just be bold. You know, pay good people a very fair fee to that are experts in their field to go and do it for you. Um, yeah. because it just saves a shit ton of time, effort, money and mistakes and all that kind of stuff. I think the second one I'd do is time off. Um, and this is what I learned from the golf club um, and the golf country club side is that w we are, we are people, we are humans and, and we have to fuel our, our health and well-being as much as we fuel our business and entrepreneurs, I feel, are like classic people that completely, you know, we are the worst people to go on holiday because we never switch off. Yeah. But for me, I take like at least a week off every 12 weeks, um, sometimes two weeks off every, tw every 12 weeks. Um, and for me, that's been fundamental to helping me continue my growth because you've got to go and you've got to go and fuel yourself if you're going to fuel your business. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs you talk to ask them last time they took any time off at all and they'll scratch their head and they might be able to say two days, you know, like nine months ago or something like that. <laughs> and I'm not talking weekends now, you know, weekends should be time off anyway. Right. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, genuine switch off time away from mobile phones and stuff. 
And then the, uh, the third, I would say, is never be scared to know the numbers, however good or bad they may be. Yeah. Um, because often when you're scaling, you know, you're working really hard, but the cash flow may not be giving you the reward that you feel that you deserve. And therefore, I think people have a tendency to shy away from really knowing the numbers and really knowing what moves the needle in your business. Yeah. Like I remember my lesson when, when I was selling like four in the digital space now, I was selling four products. Um, but there was only, there was one of them that was making me like 80% of my profit. Um, and, and, but I hung on to the other three because I felt it initially, this is going back to like 2010. Um, I felt that it, it gave, it made me look, um, credible. <coughs> Whereas actually now I go like, I just teach one method. You yeah. can learn it online. You can come and work with me in a workshop or you, or I can consult with you on it, but I just teach one technique. That is it. It's called the referral method. That's my system. It's nine accelerators to get more referrals and affiliate partnerships in your business. Um, I don't feel I need to provide anything else at all. It's one product I sell. Yeah. Um, and and I've, people sell too much to try and make themselves look credible. And that just, you know, you spread yourself too thin yeah. and you don't give yourself a chance of scaling and becoming the expert in one of them because you're trying to do too much. Yeah, I love that. Pay, pay good money for good brains, absolutely. Number two, take time off, schedule it in and take regular time off. I believe that 100%. I wouldn't have taken that advice on board 10 years ago, 15 years ago. But knowing what I know now, absolutely. Had I have done that back then, I would have grown faster mm -hmm. and a lot less stressfully. I'd probably have some more hair on my head as well. Um, so, so, yeah. Good great as well, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I've then, suffered uh, more. <laughs> number three, totally agree with that as well. Like, know the numbers. No, ha, ha, you know, no matter whether they're good or bad, be clear on the numbers because it's only through that that you can then make an educated decision on what needs to happen to to move forwards. Fantastic. So, Philip, uh, for those that are watching, listening today, that want to connect with you, uh, we mentioned the free video training around affiliate marketing and how to implement your business. Where can they get in contact with you, mate? Yeah, cool. So if they go to my website, so it's, uh, we'll put a link down, no doubt, in show notes, but uh, philipgibbs.co.uk, and that's Philip with a double L, so P-H-I-L-L-I-P-G-I-B-B-S.co.uk. Um, and uh, on the front screen there, the very first button you see takes you, uh, gives you a chance, no email required, just to uh, dive over there and uh, watch a little three-part video training from me on the referral method and how you can use it to scale your business. Fantastic. So that's it for today. Thank you so much for your time. Appreciate uh, having on the show. And for those of you that are joined us today, uh, share some love. Let us know that you like this by hitting the like below. Uh, share it with your mates, tag someone in who you think needs to hear this as well. And comment, let's, let us know what was the biggest insight or takeaway for you to Philip, mate, so grateful for your time today. Barry, I've loved it. Yeah, it's been really cool connecting and chatting. And I'd love to hear now. I'm gonna I'm gonna reverse some of those questions on you because I'd love to hear your your intake, your take on some of those. So uh, cool. We'll carry on chatting later. Yeah. Thanks so much for your time, mate. If you're in a position that many of our clients were before joining us, which is that your business is controlling you rather than you controlling your business, we would love to have a chat to you to see whether or not we might be the right fit to partner with you to help you grow and succeed in business. And over the past eight years, we've helped hundreds of business owners around the world to grow, scale and succeed in business. Uh, many of our clients report that we've helped them to triple their profits and double their time off in 12 months or less. If you jump onto YouTube and notice the hundreds of testimonies, you'd see that this is a common theme amongst them. If you're a business owner that's generating more than $300,000 a year in annual revenue, uh, whether it's 500 million, 5 million, even $10 million a year, and you're looking to take your business and your life to the next level, we might be able to help. If you're noticing that your business is lacking structure, maybe systems or processes, maybe you're not quite attracting enough or, or the right type of quality leads, making enough sales, or maybe you've been having issues finding, hiring, retaining, and training the right team members, we could be a fit for you. 
Ultimately, we believe that we never have business problems, we have personal problems that are expressed through our business. And a lot of the work we do is with you as a business owner, helping you to constantly upgrade the way that you see life, the way that you make decisions, and the way that you help construct a profitable and purpose-driven business. In order for us to do that though, you need to book in a quick uh, 15 minute application call with one of our scaling specialists here at The Game Changers. Through the 15 minute call, we're gonna ask you a bunch of questions to see if or how we might better help you. If we can't help you, we'll let you know politely and do our best to point in the direction of someone that can. However, we can help you, we'll look at booking you a one hour game plan session where we're gonna dive a lot deeper into where you and your business are at right now, where it is that you want to go in the next three, five, and 10 years time, and what are the potential roadblocks or challenges or even opportunities that are along the journey in order for you to get there uh, faster. If you're really feeling that it's time for you to experience the love and the joy of running a business again, if you're really wanting to experience a business that does actually operate without you while still producing profit, uh, we may very well be the right fit. So book in a 15 minute call, we can have a chat and uh, see where we go from there. My name is Babo Diddy and uh, thanks for listening. Hopefully we'll get a chance to talk soon.